Romans. Today, we start sort of an extended look at the issue of dinosaur physiology. So what the insides of dinosaurs were like, how their biochemistry operated, and resulted in the uh, behaviors that they could have accomplished. So this, over the course of the next four lectures, because this actually this lecture encompasses all the, the lectures up to Thanksgiving, um, it's going to look at a wide variety of different aspects to answer what was once the key question in dinosaur paleontology. Um, the result in a whole bunch of research and uh, dominated in the, the 70s and 80s, uh, it's still being investigated today, the question of were dinosaurs cold-blooded or warm-blooded? So here we have a far side cartoon from 1987. And instant later, both Professor Waxman and his time machine are obliterated leaving the cold-blooded, warm-blooded dinosaur debate still unresolved, and presumably that's yeah, not an oral one. So, um, all right. And just to uh, frame this, because, you know, after decades of teaching this class, I still encounter people who confuse this issue. Keep a mind and a distinction, uh, your mind on it, is the, of the distinctions between definitions and evidence. So there's going to be a lot of definitions that are in this. And you're going to have to know those. Like what is endothermy? What is heterothermy? What is um, poikilothermy? Et cetera. Things like that. But those are just terms we use to describe, in this case, some aspects of the, the organism. What we're going to be mostly interested in is evidence. Because after all, we can't do Dr. Waxman's experiment. We can't actually directly test the metabolism of creatures that have no metabolism anymore, because they're dead. So we have to rely on evidence. So it's very key in this part of the course, as it was throughout the rest of this course, but I really want to emphasize it. Um, make sure you understand the distinction, and when we deal with evidence, why that particular line of evidence supports one model, or a different one, or maybe is insufficient to choose between the models. So keep that in mind. So the nature of science as hypothesis testing. Um, OK. So well, for instance, you know, if, you, if you were to have a question on an exam about you know, were dinosaurs warm-blooded, you actually not have it phrased exactly like that, but your answer wouldn't be warm-bloodedness is maintaining a constant metabolic rate. You know, yeah, that's fine. That doesn't go anywhere near the question. That would be a zero points. Because that's not the evidence. You know, what you're looking for is the evidence to support it. Just to make sure that everyone's on this page. So what am I talking about when I talk about these phrases? Well, warm-blooded and cold-blooded are not highly technical terms. But they have, they, they try to get to something more specific. And we'll, we'll break that down in a bit. By the way, and I know some of you are going to find this great. Sometimes figures that don't have bullet points on them are more important than ones that do. The, the whole picture is worth a thousand words, sort of idea. OK. So among living animals, there are those that, honest to goodness, you'll feel warm to the touch. What that really means is that their body temperature is at our level or higher, and is typically higher than the ambient temperature. We call these animals warm-blooded. And they typically include Mammals and birds among living organisms. Uh, that is actually, I want to find out, some of these are, are organisms that I or my students have known personally, or I've, I've met all the animals here other than that frog. I did not take a picture of that frog, but all these other ones are pictures that either I took or students gave me pictures of. So that was one of my former students' pet uh, hedgehog, Choya. Um, so warm-blooded animals. And then there are those animals that typically feel cool to the touch, at least in the temperate zone, where the term comes from. In English, a language common in the temperate zone. Uh, if these were named in the tropics, we wouldn't have this distinction. Um, so cold-blooded animals typically, you know, their body temperature are typically lower than us because they match the ambient environment, which is typically, except for the hottest days of summer, less than our body temperature. So these include non-avian reptiles, like lizards. That was my first bearded dragon. That was Dr. Emilio Lizardo. Um, and 
and, you know, turtles as an example. That wasn't technically our turtle, but uh, Miss Turtle lived in our, uh, uh, around our house, and I got a picture of it one day. Her, I should say. We actually saw her laying eggs. So. Or fish, or amphibians, or indeed invertebrates. That's Millie the millipede, the pet of another former student of mine. So, cold-blooded, warm-blooded describes something about physiology. But, let's face it, and this is important, these terms also come loaded with cultural baggage. That is to say, some of you were freaked out by the fact that I have pet lizards. Or that I have a student who had a pet millipede. You do. You, you are. Some of you are. And you might not want to admit it publicly, but yeah. Because <laughs> that's weird, right? Yeah. It, you're only supposed to have pets of warm, cuddly creatures, right? That are furry. No. No. I, some of you are, are, are proud lizard or pet, or lizard or fish or amphibian owners. You know, that's fine. In, invertebrate owners. But culturally, creepy, cool. Let's face it. That is a big part of our culture. These animals are the animals we're supposed to like. These are the animals we're supposed to, you know, according to mother culture, not like. Okay, that's just one side. And then let's take the use of these terms, warm-blooded and cold-blooded. Culturally, we regarded this as good and this as bad, even when it comes to people. Now, when people, we're not actually talking about physiology. But let's take a look at Othello, classic play of Shakespeare. In Othello, Othello's the one who commits the murder. Spoiler alert! Okay, spoiler alert for something from 1600. But um, Othello commits the murder. He kills Desdemona. He kills his wife. That's, that's a bad thing. It is regarded as a bad thing. But you are supposed to feel somewhat sympathetic for him. Because he did it as a crime of passion. He thought she was cheating on him. And indeed, people explain it because he was a hot-blooded boar. That he was, so, so, so his emotions overcame him, and his jealousy and rage, and in that he committed this horrible act. But he is not the villain. Who is the villain in Othello? Someone here, hopefully, may have seen it. Go for it. Well, I would say there's someone even more villainous. Iago. Iago who's behind all this and pulling the strings and faking the information that Desdemona cheated on Othello, even though she didn't. And Othello is a cold, uh, sorry, Iago, a cold-blooded person. We do not, it, you know, in a, in a trial, a uh, uh, prosecution might try to point out the cold-blooded actions of someone as an excuse to not get them off, as say, we do not forgive things done in cold blood. Whereas we might be a little more lenient when passions are involved. So yes, these terms, not super scientific, they, they encompass some intellectual baggage. So I wanted to get that out of the way. But we're going to ignore that cultural baggage. I just had to address it because it is out there. Let's talk more about science here. So as I said, Warm-blooded organisms, like you know, birds and mammals, have body temperatures, and this is the rare occasion where I have a slide that shows temperatures in Fahrenheit, not centigrade. Uh, these were some uh, NASA outreach stuff, and when NASA has to do outreach to Americans, let's face it, they have to use Fahrenheit. Um, Warm-blooded animals are hotter than the ambient environment, typically. That is, we have particular body temperatures. We run up there, you know, in the typically in the 90s, some cases up in the low hundreds, and except for the hottest days of summer, that's hotter than the outside world. So we're glowing in infrared here. Um, now, if, this, if these guys had been named, well, let's just go one step further. In the temperate zone, so our ambient conditions around us, endotherms, oh, sorry, actually, ectotherms, cold-blooded animals, don't use ectotherm yet, cold-blooded animals, are, have body temperatures that match the ambient system, the ambient environment, and since that's below our body temperature, they literally feel cool to the touch. You see how the lizard and the scorpion here are cooler, represent lower temperatures than the humans holding them. And in fact, here we can look at that, that if we match the ambient conditions versus the actual body temperature, 
The warm-blooded animals, shown in red here, have relatively stable body temperatures, regardless of what the temperature is around them. There's a little bit of variation over, uh, over the outside temperature, but not super amounts. In contrast, the cold-blooded animals, shown here in green, it's not quite a slope of one, but it's pretty close to a slope of one. Their body temperatures match the outside environment. And that's why, had these terms been named in a language um, in a region that was far more tropical, let's say, let's say the basis of, of ecological physiology was developed um, by the indigenous people of the, central, of the western desert of Australia, there wouldn't have been a distinction of body temperature there. The ambient temperature is, very, is typically comparable to our inside body temperature. And so cold-blooded animals, quote unquote, wouldn't feel cool. They would feel the same temperature as warm-blooded animals. Because, you know, you take this up to about 45 degrees. There we go. Like that, yeah. So, well, we can also map the general distribution of these traits onto a phylogeny of vertebrates. And we see that cold-bloodedness is ancestral. It is primitive, and you know people will, in class, you know, I've been emphasizing the fact that primitiveness doesn't mean inferior, it just means ancestral. But some people will refer to you know, the warm-bloodedness, which evolved independently in mammals and birds, as it definitely is derived or advanced, and some people would say superior, although as we'll see, it actually has a lot of drawbacks too. And so but the, this general distribution is pretty clear. Warm-bloodedness is derived. Cold-bloodedness is, is, is ancestral. It is the default condition, not just for vertebrates, but for all animals. Uh, we will see, however, that this is a little more complicated. In fact, let's take a look at a slightly more modern and sophisticated look at the distribution of warm-bloodedness. In this case, and honest to goodness, this is just some advice when you guys are doing um, down the line, if you go on in sciences or any discipline, Think about your graphic design, and if you have, if you want to have something that highlights something that's affiliated with warm, use warm colors. It's like the worst example of graphic design I have ever seen is a graph showing silhouettes of different whales, and the blue whale is in red. Blue is freaking in its name, and go with that, that mentally, you know, you'll, you'll make that connection. So, anyway, so the dark blues here. That's warm-bloodedness. I would have made it red. So we see modern birds, warm-blooded, modern mammals, warm-blooded. But also, there's like a couple of modern lizard species that are warm-blooded. Uh, billfish, so sailfish, marlins, swordfish, some tunas, a couple other fish are warm-blooded in the typical sense. And in green, we have animals that have some sort of not quite warm-blooded, but warm-blooded-like. And these include uh, pythons and boas. These include um, one of the sea turtles, a leatherback turtle. It includes the primitive monotremes, the basal-most branch of surviving mammals. It includes some of the tunas. It includes some of the sharks. We'll talk more about that later on. So we see broadly mammals and birds characterized by warm-bloodedness, but it is sporadically listed. Uh, found in other modern organisms, and note, inferred from fossils, we see that from critters that we're interested in. We'll get to that later on. Uh, another way of thinking about this, warm-blooded animals tend to be very active, cold-blooded animals a lot less so per unit time. Um, this, these are not, I didn't take this footage, although I have had a cat of almost exactly that color, and I've had, you know, three bearded dragons so far, but uh, now this is uh, someone else's animal. So we see warm-blooded animals, active, dynamic, uh, maybe a little on the uh, crazy side there. And in contrast, the cold-blooded animal is uh, not as active, although it does, its turn is pretty quick there. But uh... Okay, let's, let's, let's think about what those terms mean. In fact, by the uh, 20th century, people recognized that warm-bloodedness and cold-bloodedness might be very broad stereotypes, and maybe we can break them down into different components. So here we go. We'll get warm-blooded versus cold-blooded. A primary one is, you know, where is the energy source coming to make the body heat? If, if warm-blooded animals are indeed warmer than the outside air, how's that happening? 
Well, they're generating heat internally. So the technical term is they have endothermy, internal heat. Or we could say that they are endothermic, if you want the adjective, or, or endotherms, if you want to talk about them as a condition. And what's happening is endotherms have an extra set of mitochondria. And you all know that by law, having said mitochondria, I have mitochondria, say it with me, the powerhouse of the cell. OK. Uh, mitochondria, which are indeed the powerhouse of the cell, um, are the things that take in nutrients, do a little biochem magic that you don't need to do with in this class, and release chemical energy to do stuff. Well, all animals, and indeed uh, eukaryotes as a total, have mitochondria. What happens is endotherms have extra mitochondria whose primary function is basically to generate heat and not much else. And it makes the body warmer overall. Cold-blooded animals lack that. In order to get hot, they need external sources. So they are ectotherms. They have the condition of ectothermy. They are ectothermic, outside heat. And that's ecto, not exo. Exo would be like projecting heat. That would be like Godzilla or Smaug or something like that. Um, so endotherms and ectotherms. And often, when we sort of want to summarize warm-blooded and cold-blooded, we'll say endotherm and ectotherm. But it's a little more complicated than that. We can also look at it from a different point of view here. In order to fuel those extra mitochondria, the warm-blooded animals need to obtain more food per unit time because they have a higher metabolic rate because some of their food is going simply to generate heat. So we say they are tacky metabolic. That's fast metabolism. They're burning more nutrients per unit time. And of course, in contrast, cold-blooded animals have relatively slow metabolic, low or slow metabolic rates, less nutrients burned per unit time. We say they're Brady metabolic. They have Brady metabolism. Um, Brady is slow. Brady puss is one of the two living genera of sloths. The name literally means slow foot. So, warm-blooded animals are endothermic and tacky metabolic. Cold-blooded animals are ectothermic and brady metabolic. And as a consequence of their physiology, most warm-blooded animals have a stable body temperature over time. We say that we are homeotherms. We have homeothermy. We are homeothermic. Same temperature. So, by which I mean, when you say, what is the body temperature of a human or a cat or a horse? or a budgie, or whatever, you can give an answer. And there is a meaningful answer. We have a body temperature. And that's a, an attribute that exists for that species. In contrast, if cold-blooded animals have body temperatures with flu which fluctuate with the ambient condition, then they don't have a body temperature. I mean, obviously, they have a body temperature. They have bodies, which has a temperature. But they don't have a particular body temperature that characterizes that species. Instead, they have a fluctuating body temperature. They are poikilotherms, fluctuating heat. So many cold-blooded animals have a temperature range in which they, at which they prefer, certainly and under which they operate best, but it is not a nap, it is not something that they have. And you know, they can cool down, cool down and be at those lower conditions and still operate. In many cases, what they do is they go into torpor. That is, they, they basically shut things down for a while, and then when it gets warm enough, they're moving around. Consequently, by the way, that's the reason why when you're going around at night in most environments, you do not have to worry about getting attacked by a snake. They're shut down. Or at this time of year, you're not going to be finding turtles and lizards and snakes around, or frogs. Some of them are staying warm enough in the leaf litter for a while to do stuff, but pretty soon they're just going to be shutting down for the rest of the winter. Now, these are stereotypes. And as I'll talk about in later lectures, there are modern mammals which are endothermic, tachymetabolic most of the time. 
but are poikilotherms of a sort, and they undergo torpor, daily torpor. So here's, uh, again, the far side, looking at some classic ones. Modern ectotherms, they can regulate their body temperature, but they do so by regulating their environment, by changing what environment they're in. And so, you know, here's a lizard. It's gotten too cold. It goes up to heat up. It's too hot, and it goes back to a cold spot. And honest to goodness, other than when they're foraging for food, that's pretty much all the motion a lizard's going to do. Uh, it's to the point where if you go to the, the National Zoo or another zoo that's got a reptile house, if you wait long enough, you sit around and you listen to people, you will hear someone say, are they alive or are they real? Because pretty much everything, unless they happen to be foraging for food at the time, is doing this. That's their life. <laughs> In contrast, you go to the small mammal house, yeah, they might be asleep, but when they're not asleep, they're bouncing around all over the place. High, for, far more level of activity. And part of that is a necessity, because a warm-blooded animal and um, Gary Larson, the artist for, uh, for the far side, is definitely taking a position here in terms of uh, thermal metabolism. That is definitely an a endothermic uh, tachymetabolic theropod because it needs to eat all the time. If you're tachymetabolic, you need fuel coming in. And so you have to spend a lot more time getting food. It's also the reason why if... You're going away for vacation for spring break or for uh, you know, Thanksgiving break or something, and you've got an ectothermic pet. You, know, you might be able to feed it before you go and not feel guilty about not leaving it food because it's not going to miss food until you get back. In contrast, if you have an endothermic pet, a tachymetabolic pet, you, you better be taking care of it during that interval or having someone take care of it because that's just cruel to not feed an endotherm on a regular basis, typically a daily or more than once daily basis. So if endothermy is so metabolically expensive, so therefore you've got to spend a lot of time getting out there and getting food, why evolve it? What is the selective advantage to being an endotherm? And you know, early days people just said, well, of course, you know, it's superior. Therefore, things are going to want to evolve it. But then stepping back, it's like, is it really? Plenty of groups of animals do fine being ectotherms. What is really the advantage? And so ecologists and thermal physiologists and others have been exploring this issue, and they've identified several, and they're not mutually exclusive, potential advantages to endothermy. An obvious one, something I've touched on already, is the amount of activity you can do goes up. Your aerobic capacity, as it's called, your ability to do stuff. So you can have greater levels of activity for longer periods. And it turns out endothermic animals tend to recover after bouts of activity much more quickly. It's not that a cold-blooded animal can't be highly active. They certainly can. Ever seen footage of like an alligator or crocodile or python or something engaged in attacking and killing something? They can certainly be really active for a while. Or a small lizard trying to get away from something. They can be really active. But it takes them a lot longer to recover from that activity than a warm-blooded animal does, like a lion or a wolf or something. A hawk. And later on, we'll explore some of the ways they're able to achieve that. Also, greater environmental tolerance. As I mentioned, you know, you go out at night, you don't have to typically worry about stepping on, or getting, rather getting attacked by an ectotherm. But, you know, if you were out in the woods, you might have to worry about a puma or a uh, wolf at night, if you're in the right or wrong part of the country, depending on your point of view. Um, and also, the actual latitudinal and altitudinal range that endotherms can exploit is much greater. There aren't typically snakes and lizards and turtles up on mountaintops. But there are birds and there are mammals. And outside of, say, role-playing games and comics and so forth, you don't worry about 
you know, Arctic serpents and polar crocodiles in the modern world, where there's a lot of ice around, there aren't ectotherms. But there might be polar bears and penguins. So endotherms can exploit far more of the world. And the reason, of course, is if you're generating heat internally, you're not dependent on the ambient temperature. And assuming you've got sufficient, say, insulation, you can keep on operating in those conditions. Also, or in, in, in addition, homeotherms, animals with a stable body temperature, can have increased metabolic efficiency. It's, and some of you, you know, if you've taken chemistry, you know about that. The rate of many chemical reactions is dependent on, on a, the temperature. Well, the body is like a bazillion chemical reactions going on, and each reaction is slightly different. If you have a particular body temperature, or a small, rather a small temperature range at which your body operates, the natural selection can tinker with your metabolic processes so they're all optimized for a particular temperature. A polykilotherm can't afford to do that. They have to operate over a broad range of body temperatures. And so they can't have that sort of precision. It's sort of like the contrast between a high-maintenance sports car, which operates super-duper well under its, high, uh, under its particular performance conditions. That's the endotherm versus an ectotherm, which has to be like a real SUV or a real Humvee. That is not like people who are just driving you know, to the mall and back home, but rather out in the country. And sometimes they might have to fuel it up with grain alcohol and so forth. It has to operate in a wide, broad area of, of conditions, but as a consequence, it can't be as fine-tuned an operating a machine. Some people have pointed out that a particular aspect of metabolic efficiency uh, that might be important here is uh, immune response to pathogens. So if you encounter a pathogen, one of, so a, a germ, one of the most common ways that animals respond in order to deal with a pathogen, if you can do it, is fever. You know, we think of fever as, a, as part of a disease, but really fever is the body's response to getting an infection. And what happens is your body kicks in, your immune response kicks in to a higher metabolic rate on the hopes that you will, can, you will move things up to a condition that the pathogen can't survive in. And so long as you can, man, you, if you can last longer than the pathogen does, then the germs die out, and then you shift back down to your normal body temperature and hopefully have survived and not died in the process. Well, you can do that if you've got the sort of metabolic control of your internal body temperature. That's far more difficult to do if you don't, if you're not capable of generating fever. Plus, a higher, metabolic, a higher body temperature in general might be above the normal operating condition of many pathogens because it's not what the outside world is normally. So some people pointed out that in some ways, warm-blooded animals are sort of in permanent fever compared to the cold-blooded animals and might be less habitable by these pathogens. And then finally, it is noted, it has been noted for some time, that the two major groups of living endotherms, birds and mammals, are also the only two groups of animals that have extended parental care. <coughs> crocodilians! <coughs> Sorry. So the people who point out this parental care thing tend to forget that crocodilians also have a... Except maybe that's going to be an important line of evidence, as we'll see in later lectures. Um, so, it is true. Mammals, birds, lots of parental care, extended parental care of the young. And there are a couple reasons why the evolution of endothermy might be important in parental care. While the young are developing, a warm-blooded warm brooding animal can keep the eggs at a constant temperature, and so they can, the, the embryo can take advantage of metabolic efficiency while developing. And similarly, if you are gestating a fetus, if you are a therian mammal, so a placental or marsupial mammal, your inside temperatures remain the same, and the same thing can happen. Natural selection can tinker so that the, the 
embryo develops far under a far more controlled circumstance, and you could specialize during that. After the baby or babies are hatched, you've got increased activity level due to your increased aerobic capacity. And so you could watch over them better. You might be able to provision them more often. So there's a lot of advantage, advantages to this. It's also worth noting that the living lizards that show something like endothermy are some of the few living lizards that actually have parental care of the young. So that's sort of like an exception that may point to this. But then again, remember, crocodilians have parental care of the young but aren't warm-blooded. Or are they? Well, they're not. They're cold-blooded. They're almost, they're almost assuredly cold-blooded. But they have a story to tell us that I'll talk about in the last lecture in this, this section. But what about non-avian dinosaurs? After all, that's what this course is about. That's what we're interested in. We go back to the discovery of dinosaurs. Think about the, some of the early lectures. The discovery of Iguanodon and Megalosaurus and Hylaeosaurus. And they were envisioned as being gigantic lizards. Not a surprise. They were only known fragmentarily. People were just beginning to understand what the ancient world was like. And so at the time, people like Mantell and Buckland assumed that dinosaurs were cold-blooded because they were big lizards. They're reptiles. Reptiles are cold-blooded by definition. So of course I did it in cold blood, you idiot. I'm a reptile. It wasn't a particular sophisticated argument, but it wasn't bad for a first approach. But it's worth noting that Sir Richard Owen, in his, in his development of the name Dinosauria and his analyses that led to the recognition that Iguanodon, Hylaeosaurus, and Megalosaurus formed a group to the exclusion of all other modern or fossil animals, that one of the things he talked about is that between the fact they probably have a four-chambered heart, like crocodiles do, we'll talk about why that's important later on, and the superior adaptation to terrestrial life, remember they had limbs directly underneath the body, they had a parasagittal stance, which in the modern world is only present in warm-blooded animals, he suggests that dinosaurs may have been more warm-blooded and more mammal-like than any living reptile. And he envisioned dinosaurs as sort of mammal-like reptiles. Not mammal-like reptiles in the sense of theraxids, proto-mammals, but members of reptilia that were, in terms of their overall behavior of moving around, finding food, and so forth, more like a big modern mammal than a land crocodile. And that's sort of the image that he was promoting when they had the models at uh, Crystal Palace put together. So just to remember, there's Iguanodon, Hylaeosaurus, well, Hylaeosaurus butt, and Megalosaurus. You get to the later 19th century, and folks like Edward Drinker Cope and O.C. Marsh during the Bone Wars, and they too, Marsh especially, pictured dinosaurs as being active and dynamic and functionally the equivalent to, ma to big mammals in terms of their behavior. So here's um, what was called at the time Lalaps by Cope, uh, what we now know as Dryptosaurus, which is the name Marsh gave it, and a primitive Tyrannosauroid from eastern North America, engaged in, a, in fighting like, you know, um, like roosters or, or kangaroos or something of that nature, lions, you know, really dynamic fighting going on. So one of the first paintings by the great artist Charles R. Knight. But then that generation died out. The 19th century paleontologists die out. Their successors, like Henry Fairfield Osborne, the guy who really got the American Museum of Natural History going and so forth, this new generation had a different view. And as I talked about back in the lecture on the history of dinosaur studies, they also, although they continued to research on dinosaurs, they didn't find them as compelling a research subject as the earlier generations did. They felt that serious science would be more concentrated on things like mammals and proto-mammals and fish and so forth. And when they were consulting with artists, in some cases the exact same artists who drew the, the Dryptosaurus picture, this new generation of paleontologists in the early and mid-19th century 
focused on them being slow-moving, stupid sidelines of the history of life. So here's a tail dragging Diplodocus. And this is a parody of that view, but it's actually it's a parody that's not too far off of sort of the extreme opinion. So yes, pterosaurs aren't dinosaurs, although we will talk about pterosaurs during this lecture section. You know, flying into cliff faces or getting hung up in trees, the super lethargic uh, theropod that can't even move, and even more lethargic theropod over here, a sauropod that doesn't know to pull its head out of the water, and this stupid theropod going to munch its own tail. So dinosaurs are slow-moving, sluggish. You know, equivalence to modern, uh, modern lizards, if not worse. And that was sort of a dominant idea in terms of the physiology of dinosaurs, Dinosaurs being just lizards plus, lizards on a giant scale, um, began to shift in the 60s and 70s. And a lot of that shift was due to the work of this guy, John Ostrom. And among other things, the discovery that was about to attack him from behind, the Deinonychus. But, so Ostrom, as a graduate student um, at Columbia, did his work on revising our understanding of the duck bills. And he was one of the first scientists to point out the significance of the dental batteries. So remember, dental batteries were all these teeth, um, you know, more teeth that are in the jaws of any other dinosaur operating together as one big functional grinding unit. Now, what Ostrom pointed out is that this is sort of a metabolically expensive thing to do. Other dinosaurs, even, as well as many modern reptiles, can get away with a much fewer number of teeth in the jaws. Now, prior to Ostrom's work, many of the paleontologists considered duckbills, hadrosaurids, to have been eating only soft water plants because their teeth were insufficient to dealing with that. And he said, have these people even looked in the jaws? Of a hadrosaur, these are grinders. These are specialized grinders. In fact, they are better adapted than mammalian uh, molars for grinding in their own way. And so, why evolve them? Why go to the effort of evolving that? Well, this is useful if you want to take a big volume of plants and render it into lots of little small bits quickly. Why is that important? Why chew your food? The answer isn't because your mom told you to do that when you were a little kid. Well, it's a good reason, but that's not actually the metabolic reason. The metabolic reason is chemistry operates on surface areas. In the case of chemistry, so chemistry is the interaction of atoms, molecules. They have to touch each other. You know, physics can operate on surface areas, but it can also operate on volumes or whatever, depending upon which part of physics we're talking about. Chemistry has to operate on surface area. You need to have molecule touching molecule. Digestion is chemistry. So if you want to digest stuff quickly, if you want the nutrients out of food quickly, you have to take a block of food and increase the surface area of that volume, that is, break it apart. It's like if you had a one kilogram chunk of ice as a cube, and then you take another similar sized chunk of ice and smash it on the ground, which one is going to evaporate faster? What's going to melt faster? The one that's in shatter, that gets in physics, not chemistry, but you've increased the surface area. And if you want to digest the food, you want to break it down into little bitty bits so your enzymes can grab those particles and break them down rather than just swallowing it whole and waiting for it to digest slowly. Now, modern cold-blooded reptiles can get away with swallowing their food whole for the most part. You know, they chomp down big chunks of food. In the case of snakes, they only swallow their food whole because they just they digest really slowly because they don't need those nutrients right away. They can afford for digestion to take its time. But warm-blooded animals need that energy right away. They've got to fuel those mitochondria. And so Ostrom argued, you're only going to evolve the dental battery if that organism has a high metabolic rate. It needs those nutrients, and so therefore natural selection can favor breaking down that food very quickly. 
In his postdoc work, Ostrom looked at the other major group of Ornithischians that evolved the dental battery and pointed out that you know, people have been sort of missing this, and some people were saying you know, that Ceratopsians have these weak jaws, and again, have they ever looked at a Ceratopsian, he thought? You know, evolving the shearing dental battery, again, suggests these animals needed to increase the rate of digestion. Now, he did point this in contrast to some other Ornithischians. You know, not all Ornithischians have as complicated an apparatus for chewing food. They all chew food to some degree, but you know, hadrosaurids and ceratopsids are at a level above and beyond we see in typical dinosaurs. So here's a hadrosaurid, a, a, a notosaurid and chylosaurid. And it's got, you know, I did talk about it, it's got some bit of chewing going on, you know, the back and forth motion of the jaw, the rotation there, but not as sophisticated as the big dental batteries of the other guys. And then similarly, Ostrom pointed out this guy, Deinonychus, to the his discoveries. First of all, its anatomy suggested it was fast, it was agile, it could leap around and attack with that lower claw, and I know you guys have never lived in a situation where that wasn't the view of raptors. You've only lived in a world where that view of raptors is part of the, is part of the collective psyche of mankind. But it wasn't always. And when Deinonychus was first described, this was sort of a radical view of a way dinosaurs could operate. You know, the previous image of carnivorous dinosaurs was basically that they were like Komodo dragons on two legs. And yeah, it would have been aggressive and powerful, but not particularly dynamic in terms of attacking. Um, and when you know, paleontology picks this up in the latest 60s and 70s, and it takes Hollywood a little while longer, before we get the Jurassic Park movie in 1993, but then the whole world knows about raptors and gets terrified of them. And this, for this weapon to be useful, it has to be a dynamic, agile animal, which is a different view of the way predation was perceived in dinosaurs at the time. And in the 70s, Ostra began to point out the great number of anatomical similarities between dinonychosaurs and early and modern birds. Now, modern birds are all warm-blooded. And so somewhere in the history of birds, warm-bloodedness evolved. Most, although to be fair, not all, paleontologists of the 70s and 80s accepted that Archaeopteryx was a warm-blooded animal. And yet, bone for bone, measure for measure, Archaeopteryx is anatomically more similar to Deinonychus and Velociraptor and Truodon than it is to hawks and falcons and ostriches and so forth. So if Archaeopteryx was warm-blooded, why, Ostrom would argue, would anyone say that Deinonychus and Velociraptor weren't? What's the argument there? And so people began to think about that. And so Ostrom's, uh, 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 so this idea was stewing in his head, and then Ostrom also really presented a lot of these ideas uh, at a conference that had not much to do with thermal physiology, and in fact was trying to incorporate the newly discovered aspect of plate tectonics into paleontology. Previous to this, previous to the late 60s and early 70s, people would use the presence of dinosaurs in the Cretaceous, or therapsid proto-mammals in the Triassic and, and, uh, and Permian at high latitudes, at polar regions, as evidence that those places must be tropical. And the argument goes, cold-blooded animals need warm temperatures. Big cold-blooded animals definitely need high temperatures. If they're present in the polar regions, the polar regions at the time had to have been hot. Uh, and then, Ostrom was pointing out that these Reconstructions of, say, the Cretaceous period, or finding dinosaurs up in the north slope of Alaska, or down in southern Australia, those regions turned out to be cold at the time. Now, not as cold necessarily as they are today, but within snowy conditions. So the north slope of Alaska turns out to have conditions in the Cretaceous, something like Maine or southern Alaska, which granted are not the conditions they are in the north pole of Alaska today, but are still cold, and they're not places where we get alligator-sized animals, much less, you know, 
uh, cold-blooded reptiles the size of elephants. Yeah. Would the feathers also be an indication of formlessness because they can't self-regulate? Yes. We'll get to the question of insulation uh, in a future lecture. At this point, remember, we don't have any evidence of in insulation in dinosaurs other than birds. But yes, you're absolutely right. You're, you're, you're tracking there. Insulation is going to be important. So here we have polar condition dinosaurs, or cold condition dinosaurs, where they shouldn't be if they're cold blooded. And to point out, in the Permian, you know, we've got these huge glaciers in the southern hemisphere, and right around them, we have conditions in which there are theraptids living. And so Ostrom said, look, we've got other anatomical evidence that theraptids and dinosaurs may not have been cold-blooded. Stop using them as paleoenvironmental indicators. And then that allowed him as, a, as an excuse to start explaining ideas about maybe dinosaurs were in fact, and, and non-mammalian theraptids as well, maybe they weren't cold-blooded animals. Um, his former student, um, his former undergraduate student, went on to a uh, career at Harvard, and then later elsewhere, this is Robert T. Bakker, and in fact, a lot of the illustrations I was showing recently, there's a little R. Bakker at the side, were done by him. He took these ideas and continued them even further and uh, promoted them. We'll talk about one of his main contributions in a lecture. It'll pro we'll probably get to that on Friday. And this new revitalization of dinosaur research, focusing especially on physiology, but also on the relationship with birds and on dinosaurian behavior, became known as the dinosaur renaissance. And in fact, that specifically that term comes from an article that Bakker wrote in National Geographic, sorry, uh, in Scientific American. So a new view of dinosaurs. And here's the parody of that. And yeah, this is the parody. So we have dinosaurs being smart. How do you know they're smart? Because they're playing chess. By definition, people who play chess are smart. That's part of our culture. And they're dynamic. You know, they're playing tennis with their frills. The pterosaurs are engaged in, you know, fancy uh, aerial maneuvers, the uh, theropods are dancing, and the sauropods are cliff diving. So, a new view of the opinion. So, sort of looking at some of the evidence that were being suggested at this time. Starting with Owen, you know, back in the 1840s, parasagittal posture, digitigrade stance. That's something we see in modern mammals and birds. We don't see any living, cold-blooded animal with such a posture. And at least some of these animals have sophisticated, fe sophisticated feeding adaptations. Indeed, pretty much all dinosaurs show some level of sophistication in terms of feeding adaptations beyond what we see in a lizard or a snake or a turtle or a croc. Also, I didn't put this in these slides, but I just, we just talked about dinosaur size before. One important aspect, and we'll talk more about it in a lecture coming up, dinosaur brains are often well above the ground. And to get blood up to that brain, you've got to work against gravity. So you've got to have a really active, powerful heart. But an active, powerful heart, by definition, is some constant metabolic activity going on. And it requires a high metabolic rate. And when we think about things like a big theropod, and especially a big sauropod, where the head, where the brain might be like, you know, four meters above the ground or more. That's a lot of action that has to go on. And the latitudinal diversity, so the presence of dinosaurs in colder climates, were all some of the lines that dinosaurs may have had high metabolic rates. And everyone was totally convinced, and that's the end of the lecture. No, everyone wasn't convinced. But this at least got the debate going. And so what we're going to begin to explore and continue for several lectures are some of the newer types of evidence that people used to begin to examine the question. Now, one of these issues is aspects of bone histology. And noting the time, we will pick up on Wednesday by looking at bone histology and its record of physiology. So take care, and I will see you on Wednesday.